Welcome to this physics models course by Kastaban. That's me. The topic is SI unit and the definition of time. After going through this, please feel free to subscribe and share with your friends on YouTube. Also log in to my website physicsmodels.in. The SI unit of time is second. That's easy. But the more challenging question was, what is an exact one second? Meaning something like 1.0000 seconds. And the moment we talk about that kind of an accuracy, we are talking about a super clock. The best watches that I have heard of can be divided into mechanical and automatic categories. Mechanical will have plus minus two seconds per day. The automatic watch best one will give you 0.01 seconds per day accuracy. So at the end of the day, you'll be off by only plus minus 0.01 seconds per day, which is probably great enough for most of our daily work. Still, this was not good enough for scientists because they want an absolute reference standard. For creating this kind of standard, the target that scientists would have in mind is a watch or a super clock, which would not only measure one second accurately, but would be off by one second in one million years. Imagine that kind of accuracy. We don't need a watch of that accuracy, of course. So the scientists started thinking of precise wavelengths based on atoms radiation instead of trying to make better and better gears. Let's look at the SI definition of time. The committee published it in 1967. They upgraded that in 1997 and the latest one was in 2018. In 1967 itself, they said one second is the duration of so many wavelengths of atomic radiation from cesium-133 atom during some transition between two hyperfine levels. Right now, we may not understand what it is, but I'll explain in detail as we go along. In 1997, they only added a temperature condition that this whole thing must be measured at zero degree Kelvin or absolute zero. In 2018, they made the definition more comprehensive by stating the exact condition under which the frequency of the emission from the atom is measured. And that frequency, they said, will be one second of duration. Let's understand atomic oscillator or what is atomic transition. In 1900, Max Planck said that the energy of an atomic oscillator is in terms of quantum. That's how the quantum mechanics came into play. And that the energy of each quantum packet, E is equal to HV, H is Planck's constant and V is a frequency. In 1905, Einstein explained that the electromagnetic radiation also happens in terms of energy packets. Okay? And these packets are photons. And again, the energy is equal to H into V. In 1913, Niels Bohr explained that atoms also exist in states of discrete energy, not something which is continuous. So from energy one, they can move to energy two or come back to energy one. And the delta E or the energy change between these states is also equal to H into V. Therefore, V is equal to delta E by H. This V became called the fundamental frequency. Therefore, scientists started making atomic oscillators to get the accurate timing they decided to first make a ammonia controlled oscillator that was a quantum oscillator in 1947 in 1949 the clock was built in washington the accuracy was fantastic and the variation in timing was only 1 by 10 to the power 8 seconds which is great and in 1954 the scientists wanted to make an even higher accuracy of uh, atomic oscillators. So the work was on to build more and more accurate atomic oscillators. In the year 1955 to 58, scientists decided on cesium-133 atom as the most suitable material in the periodic table for several reasons. And they used the concept of atomic transition, which we are going to see now. So let's say in a very simple way that microwave radiation was put on the atoms. The atoms got that energy. They changed their energy state from A to B. They became more excited. 
and therefore photons were emitted from the CS133 atom. They had that fundamental frequency V0 plus some added frequency. That plus some added frequency was a delta V which we can say is some kind of a error due to the microwave radiation being put on the atoms. So then the scientists control the microwave radiation very accurately and they could come to a situation where the emitted fundamental frequency was exactly V0 uh, as per that number 91926317770 cycles per second and they had achieved an exact and precise second. Then they built the first cesium clock in England. Let's now understand a visual of atomic transition which I have made for you. In the center is the nucleus of a CS133 atom, let's say, and it has 55 protons. So there should be 55 electrons because it's a balanced atom. Out of these 55 electrons, 54 are rotating around that nucleus. And there is one lone electron in the outermost orbit called the 6s orbit and that's called the valence electron. That's the electron scientists played with to create the atomic transition. To understand atomic transition, it's important to understand the concept of spin. I have given a very simplified picture here. On the right hand side, you can see the blue colored electron, which is spinning around its own axis, the white axis. It's also spinning around the nucleus, around that orbit, which are shown by those yellow arrows. That's called the orbital spin. There are two kinds of spin for the electron. On the left hand side, you can see the nucleus. If the nucleus also spins, shown by that blue arrow about the dotted uh, axis, then that's called a nucleus spin. And that also happens under certain circumstances, which we will see. So all this spin causes an interaction of the magnetic fields of the nucleus as well as that of the valence electron. Going back to the SI definition, we saw those words called unperturbed ground state. What does this mean? It means that the CS133 is not disturbed and it should be in its ground state, meaning no energy is given to it and it should not be acted upon by the Earth's magnetic field and so on. It should be fully isolated and it should be in a state of rest. That's the meaning of these words. Now, coming to the spin, the nucleus will not have a spin in its ground state and on the right hand side the valence electron may have a spin and we come to the concept of fine splitting versus hyperfine splitting. Fine splitting means that the valence electron spin interacts with the orbital spin. The two kinds of spin of the electron itself, right? Both of them interact and there are some complex magnetic fields. But this is not hyperfine splitting. Hyperfine splitting happens when the emission from an atom creates spectral lines and those lines are fine lines which are very close to each other, meaning that the energy input to cause those two lines are very small energy inputs. And that's the whole advantage of creating a clock with small energy inputs. So hyperfine splitting is very important as compared to just fine splitting. Talking of spin, this hyperfine splitting happens when not only the electron is spinning, but also the nucleus is spinning. Both are spinning. These spins have been given a spin quantum number. Right now we go with the numbers that are in scientific literature. So CS133's lone electron in the outermost orbit, the valence electron, gets the spin quantum number F is equal to half and the nucleus which is spinning has a spin quantum number F is equal to 7 by 2. Let us now understand what happens next. Look at the two photographs. 
On the left hand side, the nucleus and the electron are spinning in the same direction. That's called as parallel in scientific parlance. On the right hand side, the nucleus and the valence electron are spinning in opposite directions. That is called as non-parallel in scientific parlance. These two kinds of spin cause two energy sublevels to get created during this hyperfine splitting. When both are rotating in the same direction, the total spin quantum number for the atom as a whole adds up. So F will be 7 by 2 plus half, that will be 8 by 2, that's 4. When the spin is in opposite directions, the total spin quantum number for the whole atom will be F is equal to 7 by 2 minus half, that will be 6 by 2, that is 3. This is very important. So two energy sublevels, 3 and 4, get created. Now that we have understood energy sublevels, the job becomes easy and we can now understand what is to be done with atomic transition. So what we have to do is we have to give energy in the form of electromagnetic or microwave radiation to the group of CS133 atoms, a whole lot of them. And the energy that we give should be sufficient for the sub-levels 3 and 4, the energy that's there for those levels. And then the atoms will absorb this radiation that we have given, they will get excited. And what happens next? Since the atoms have got excited and gone to a higher energy state, if you switch off the giving of radiation to these atoms, then after some small fraction of a second, the atom will emit the same radiation. When it emits the radiation, the exact fundamental frequency will come out of the atom, which is the number given there, and you will get exactly one second. The wavelength of that radiation is 32.6 mm, and that's therefore belonging to the microwave region. This picture shows a very simplified visual, where the yellow arrows are shown as impinging radiation on the CS133 atom which gets energized from sub-level 3 to sub-level 4 energy level and then output is the frequency of the radiation emitted by the CS133 atom which is the important one to measure uh, time. If we now look at the SI committee's definition, we should be able to understand every word of it. I wish you now understand every word of it. The second is defined by taking the fixed numerical value of the cesium frequency, delta Cs, the unperturbed ground state hyperfine transition frequency of the cesium-133 atom to be 9192 631770 when expressed in the unit hertz, which is equal to one second. And incidentally, the highest accuracy of the best cesium atomic clocks is such that it will lose only one second in 50 million years. That's simply fantastic. I've included this visual, which is a beautiful picture of a cesium atomic clock. On the left is the so-called box where cesium is placed and you can see the microwave synthesizer at the middle of the round long cylinder and all the equipment like controls which are there to operate the uh, atomic clock. This wonderful picture shows a real cesium-133 atomic clock Thanks for the picture to the Canadian Research Authorities, this is available on the net. And this gives you a kind of a feel of what the clock looks like. Thank you very much, I hope you enjoyed this uh, course and I wish that you get that bridge to cross the river of physics. All the best and have a great day.